The Zephonphorus Maiai is a, is a big, robust sword that was only discovered in 2002. Uh, these were brought back from Rio Belair in Honduras, and uh, they are notable for the fact they're a very heavy-bodied uh, sword tail, and they'll get to be just about six inches. Some of the biggest males will. Um, their behavior is very different than the Hellerai. Uh, they are uh, very social. They like living in close quarters. Um, as you can see here, you, you don't have the jockeying amongst males that you normally see. They're very collaborative. They, they live very tightly together. You almost never see them fighting or chasing one another. Um, they're well behaved with other species. Uh, if there are issues, it's that uh, uh, they can be a little skittish. They still are wild in their behavior. So for instance, if somebody comes over and they don't know them, there might be 20 or 30 big adults in a tank and they'll disappear into the plants and they might not come out for 15, 20 minutes until they get comfortable with whoever's in the room. Um, kind of an interesting fish, one of my favorite swords. Uh, they're also really prolific. They produce quite a few fry. Uh, the fry raise up very easily. Uh, they're very hardy. Uh, they're kept here uh, at 7.4 pH at 90 ppm. I run them about uh, between 72 and 76 degrees through most of the year. And uh, they're a big fan of worms, so we, get, we give them chopped earthworms, white worms, uh, frozen bloodworms, uh, frozen tube effects. Uh, they like those all very much. And they also do very well and grow out on regular dry foods. The Zephophis Maiai really are one of my favorite fish. And I first obtained them shortly after they were first discovered in 2002. I believe they were initially called Zephophis PMH. Um, I had a population for about a year, uh, then there was a break, and I re-obtained these as my eye a couple of years later, and I've had them now for uh, probably a good 13-14 uh, years. As you can see how big these guys are, these are just in a 40s reader. They like being kept in fairly close quarters. Uh, they're well behaved with one another, they get along really well with one another. And uh, it was out of these tanks that I got a couple of males that had reached 6 inches. So. Here's an idea of how big they are. You can see how distinctly different they are than any other type of sword tail. This is a 75 gallon tank of my eye uh, young and gravid females. Uh, there may be a couple of males in here. But the females generally get put into here. They drop their fry, they go into the plants. They're not big fry eaters, so the fry pick up numbers pretty quickly. And uh, so they're quite prolific, very hardy and a uh, great sword tail if you're interested in something that needs about you can keep them in smaller than a 30 gallon tank but uh, you know these guys are gorgeous when you get a good group of them especially the males in a in at least a 40 gallon tank and they do very well a 30 gallon will do fine but i wouldn't go much smaller The Maiai, just like every other sword, will cross with the other swords, so they should never be kept with another sword tail in the same tank, like the Alvarezai, for instance. And you can see at this size, these are adolescents that haven't yet sexed out. They look just like, you know, so many other species of sword tail. Uh, they could be Hellerai, possibly. They could certainly be Alvarezai. And you don't really, you can't easily tell these guys uh, as to whether they're Maiai for sure until they develop that thick caudal peduncle, which doesn't really start to show itself until they reach sexual maturity. So uh, you want to make sure to keep these guys separate uh, because they can be difficult to tell apart. And the females are just about impossible to tell apart. So between, say, the Maya and the Alvarez and some of the others until they're full grown. Um, at that point, the Maya are obvious because they're much larger fish. So the first question today, Brian asks, there's fry in my tank this morning. I'm hatching some brine shrimp. Do you usually separate the fry from the adults? 
And if so, at what size and how do you do so? When I first started keeping live bearers, you know, you get these great swords and you get these great limias and various things and you raise them up and you want to get them as big as possible and you get great color and so people come over, yeah, look at my great adult fish, this is all great. Yeah, and over here I've got some fry going, isn't that cool? And you never knew what to do with the fry. You take them and you put them in a breeder or whatever and, you know, try to raise them up and just have your fingers crossed and hope that, you know, the most survive and that, the, and that uh, those that uh, do survive actually look like anything. And then, you know, and so I kept going like this for you always had the adults and, it, and the tank looked great and all this kind of stuff. And then there was this, this extra problem off to the side as to how do you raise the fry. You know, you really can't leave them with the adults because they get eaten oftentimes. Or, or they certainly don't compete well against the adults with, for, you know, for food. And so they don't grow as well as they could and such. So you've got like little containers going or various things. And then one day, and some of you are going to laugh because this is kind of stupid, but... Um, one day it, it occurred to me that since I breed everything here, that all the adult fish I have in my room, all these fish that look so great, are directly the result of how successful I am at raising the fry. Because the fry I've got coming up are going to be the future adults. <coughs> and these fish only live two to four years. So for me that was a mind blower because I was like, oh my god, i got to focus on the fry. And where I was before focusing on the adults and, you know, just make an effort so that for that first month or so that they do their best. So the issue with fry is that you got to keep food go going into them and at the same time keep their water quality good. So you're usually doing a lot heavier water changes with uh, fry than you would with the adults, particularly if you raise them in a small tank. Um, I generally always will move fry to a separate container. Um, uh, I don't use five gallons here, but a ten gallon I have found is is pretty small enough for, for most batches of fry, um, uh, they'll do well. But this is another thing too, have you ever gone to a pet store and you buy an animal, you buy a pet, and you, uh, you, you find out what it eats, and you go and you, 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 know, you buy whatever it is that, uh, that this thing eats, you bring it home, you're all excited, you find yourself with a piece of string or whatever dangling this food in front of this animal trying to get it to eat something, and through the back of your mind you're going, how in the world does this thing ever survive in the wild? You know, here I am having to dangle food in front of it to get it to eat in captivity. You know, how in the world can this thing possibly survive outside of uh, my making all this effort to get it to feed? Well, some of the fry are the same way. In other words, if you try to raise fry in a container that's too large, they, they may not find the food. They often don't find the food. They certainly may, they may not compete as well uh, against their brethren to, to, to feed. And so you end up with a situation where you'll lose fry if the tank you put them in is too large. So, for instance, those fry I talk about that do well in a 10-gallon, they would not do well to start off in a 20. And I'm talking about live berries and most of the swords and things here. Because it's simply too large of an aquarium. So, anyway, um, uh, you want to you keep the, uh, the, the food going in, keep the water quality up, do water changes as, as much as necessary. Of course, you've got uh, some sponge filtration uh, with the fries. You don't want a filter that's going to suck the fry up. Um, and then I usually try to keep the fry, uh, let them grow out for at least three weeks for most species. And some, for some species, that's not enough. But uh, usually by a month, they can be put back in with the adults without having to worry about their getting picked on. Um, I used to keep Brachyraphis here, which is one of the, one of the uh, very similar to the Gambusias, and they're really big on eating their fry. And I had a group of three-week-old fry, and I put them into a tank of, of adults, and just watched in horror as the adults ate all the fry up. So, you know, you, you want to get them big enough so that they can get into, go into the adult tank and, and live comfortably. For most of the regular swords, uh, three weeks uh, is fine. Um, uh, to, you know, certainly hold them off to a month if you can. Because the longer you've got them separated, the longer you can feed them really intensively and that they'll eat well and such before they have to compete with the other fish in the tank. So anyway, hopefully that gives you some, some great ideas on, on fry raising and uh, we'll go to the next question. For our next question, David asks, I've heard mixed claims about keeping male swords together. Some have said they can only be kept in the usual one to two male to female ratio. But I've also heard it said that you can keep all males together, uh, in together so long as there are no females and they are kept in groups larger than four or five and adequate space and hiding places are provided. I would like to keep seven to ten in a heavily planted 75 gallon tank, though I'm considering larger size tanks. 
My plan was to keep a separate smaller tank with a few select females to occasionally breed to restock my tank as needed and perhaps sell off a few of the nicer offspring every now and then. My experience is that you can pretty much always keep males together um, of any species. Um, it doesn't have to be two or three or you know five or twenty or whatever. Um, the behavior of the males toward one another is dependent on whether there's females around uh, generally. Um, a male isn't going to be exerting dominance and pushing the other uh, younger males around uh, if there's no females uh, to show off to. So generally the males can always be kept together. Um, but the best way to determine the ratio between the number of males and the number of females when you want to breed for the most efficient and greatest yields um, is, is different for different species, has a lot to do with the dominance traits in the particular males of that species, and to answer this question better, we have to go to video. When trying to decide um, whether a species will breed best with uh, just a group with a bunch of males and a bunch of females, or whether or not you should have, say, one male to a bunch of females, um, uh, I can't imagine a situation where you would have a bunch of uh, uh, males and few females. But it comes down, and what I do is I try to determine how hierarchical or how territorial is the species. And the more territorial and hierarchical they are, the more they establish you know, a regime and the males fight with one another, um, the, the, more, uh, the, the more likely you'll see better success having as few males as possible with many females. Now this is an Iliadon Ili Fersidens tank, and because of the demand for them right now, um, I'm trying to breed up as many as them I can as quickly as possible, so I have them in a variety of breeding setups. In this situation, I have a couple males with a group of females, and I'm getting good production. I have quite a few, quite a few young that are happening here, and uh, they have just come about in the last couple of weeks. So I, so I generally tend to have better luck breeding these guys in smaller groups with fewer males, although you can put more than one male in a tank and they still will, will do okay. Now in contrast, if you have a fish, like here's some more of the Fersidens, and the males do tend to spar with one another a little bit and uh, fighting over the females, you can have a big tank like this where you've got pretty much an even mix of males and females. Although right now this tank's probably higher in males because I pulled a few out of them, of the females out to, to breed in the smaller tanks. But the point being that in a tank with this many fish in it, where you'd expect to get lots of fry, um, this tank produces very few fry. There's a good 25, 30 adults in here and I rarely get any spawns out of here because it is important that I um, pay attention to how many females and how many males I have to get the breeding I'm looking for. So in this case, the way of getting the best breeding is taking one or two males and putting them with five or six females into a smaller tank, and then I'm getting, getting decent breeding. Now with a swordtail species such as these Montezumas, I deliberately have a few of my best males the biggest males with that I knew were going to, you know, possess hopefully the longest swords, and with a large number of females, and uh, the result has been that this tank pretty much stays full of fry. If I were to have, say, an even number of males and females in here, uh, the amount of fry I would get, even for the same number of females, would be about half of what's in here now. So it comes down to, uh, like I said, with ratio with these guys, the males will, will happily spend all their day fighting with one another and not breeding. And, uh, and you don't want that. So to get the most effective breeding out of these Montes in this tank, I have, like I say, a number of females and just a few of the better males. Now you can go just totally in the other direction. This is a tank of uh, Zephophorus Maiai. These guys get along totally well. The males don't have any, they don't seem to show any dominance behavior with one another. They get along just fine and dandy. Um, the males and females get along well with one another. The females get along. So uh, you can mix any number of males and females in a tank 
and your females just stay pregnant all the time. Um, uh, and uh, the Maiai are probably the easiest in the sense of, of breeding them. They'll, they'll keep whatever tank you put them into pretty much full of fry and they, as a rule, don't eat their fry either, which is another plus. Lastly, these are the, the rare otapas, and these are probably the most dominant, most hierarchical swordtail here. And the only way I get these to breed is to put them in a really big tank uh, with uh, lots of big adults and lots of plants. And then they seem to, just because they're, they're primarily very prolific, uh, they manage to keep these plants full of fry, and then I go in here and pull the young out. Um, as I have room to grow them out. But uh, this is a good example of a fish where if I, if I were desperate for numbers on these guys and I had to bring them up quickly, say like I've got going on with the persons right now, <coughs> I, would, um, I would put uh, one male in with uh, uh, three or four females into, uh, into 10s or 20s, maybe 15s or 20s, and then uh, pull the females out to save the young as they get gravid. But these guys, I would not want to put too many males in at a time because they'll just spend their time uh, bantering with one another. Well, thank you for watching this episode on the Zephophorus Maiai. Um, and the next one that's coming up will be on the whole ordering process here, why I do things the way I do, uh, and how I determine shipping, and all of that. So anyway, I hope that you enjoy it. And of course, there'll be questions with it as well on fish stuff. And uh, take care, and I'll see you soon.